house of the Lord. It's good to have the opportunity to bring worship to you wherever you are. It's an opportunity, it's a great opportunity to come before you and to praise and worship our God, to worship him in spirit and in truth. So as we come this morning to worship him, I'm just going to ask that you join me in prayer. Almighty and everlasting, eternal God, we come to you this morning in all of the challenges that we face. We put them aside for a moment, and God, we focus our attention on what it means to truly worship you in spirit and in truth. And so, God, right now, we just ask that you'll guide us in our worship, guide us in our praise, guide us in our adoration and our love. God, we ask that you will continue to bless, rule, and abide in our lives. In Jesus' name, we thank you, and we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you, everybody. Let's worship God together.
so many ways you made, so many times. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then we just remind them you were better than good to me. Praise God for who all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Good morning to you, brothers and sisters, all across the land. Today we our text will be coming out of Amos, fifth chapter of Amos. Fifth chapter of Amos, we're going to start at the 21st verse. I want to greet you in the marvelous name of our Lord Jesus. We want to acknowledge your continued blessings and your continued consideration of the great things that God is doing. We're in Amos, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 21. I want to acknowledge uh, all of you who have had the opportunity to join us here, whether you're joining us on Instagram Live, or Facebook Live, YouTube Live, or perhaps you will be joining us later on in one of our recorded. To all of you all who are on our teleconference, we welcome you this morning as well. Uh, we want to welcome all of you for joining us in worship today. Amos, the fifth chapter, verse 21. The Lord says, I hate, I despise your feast, your feast days, I, and, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fat and peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your song. For I will not hear the melody of the string of your string instruments, but let justice run down like water, and righteousness like a mighty stream. But let justice run down like water, and righteousness like a mighty stream. Today I would like to share with you on the topic, on the subject, still overcoming. Still overcoming. On Friday we celebrated the 57th anniversary of the March on Washington, held in 1963, at which time a young preacher from Georgia and towards the end of the march, they decided that he had originally not been on the schedule to speak, but they decided that it would be a travesty to close out the march without hearing from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. So they gave him a brief period of time, and he went under the Lincoln Memorial, and he penned the words of a speech that we now know very, very famously as the I Have a Dream speech. In that speech, at that march, as they marched not only for equal rights for African Americans, but they also marched for jobs for people. They also marched against inequality. They also marched against poverty. <clears throat> In that speech that he gave that day, he recognized that verse from Amos that God had given to the Israelites that justice should roll like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. In us, justice should, should flow like water, and, and in us, righteousness should flow like a mighty stream. It is clear that in this nation, all these years later, we are still overcoming. We are still overcoming racism. We are still overcoming inequality. We're still overcoming injustice because it has not arrived on our shores. But my brothers and my sisters, I want to challenge us because I think that sometimes, even as we fight against injustice and inequality, sometimes we perpetuate it. And it's important for us, those who call ourselves the children of the living God, to check ourselves. To check ourselves to make sure we're living lives that represent justice flowing like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. 
If you look at verses 21 and 22, he's speaking to the nation. He's challenging the nation. He's saying, I don't want <clears throat> your fake phony worship and your fake phony practices and, 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 your, and I can't stand your feast because you're fronting. You're coming in here acting like you truly uh, serve and believe me, but you're not living like it. And if we haven't learned anything from this pandemic, if we haven't learned anything from our time away from the houses of worship, if we haven't learned anything in our time away from the sanctuary, hopefully we have learned what it means to worship God in spirit and in truth. Because in these days, these past six months, we haven't had the privilege of worshiping to show ourselves off to everybody else. Uh, we haven't had the privilege of coming in in our finery to present ourselves and to show people how good we look when we worship. But if you've been worshiping God in these past six months in your living room or, or on your patio or on your deck or, or in your kitchen, if you've been worshiping God in these past few days, you haven't had an audience to perform for. Hopefully in these times we have built a stronger relationship with our God and hopefully in these times we've learned what true worship means. We learn how to worship him in spirit and in truth from our hearts and from the depth of our souls. This is important, my brothers and sisters. People take light of the civil rights movement. They take light of the march on Washington. But this is real stuff. See, the civil rights movement, they were demonstrating and protesting. They were looking to win something. They were looking to win voter rights and equal rights and into segregation and Jim Crow. And, 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 and contrary to popular belief, everybody in America, every black person in America, wasn't really supporting and celebrating with the march. They marched against as much as they marched for. But what they try to provide for us is a moral high ground upon which to stand. So it wasn't an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It was nonviolent civil disobedience because they were get, determined to show that love trumps hate. And today, if we're going to win this battle, we've got to do the same thing. Not only must we challenge the status quo and challenge the structure to be broken and torn down and that equal rights will be able to flow and justice will flow like right water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Not only do we have to fight against the establishment and against the man, but we got to fight against each other. We have to fight to make sure that we are giving the same justice and the same righteousness that we are demanding from others, that we're giving the same love that we're demanding from others. The same consideration that we're demanding from others. This relationship with God, this is not just some, some, some game we play. I take this very seriously because this is about how we present ourselves. This is about how we gather together. This is the, what we bring to bear upon this. There are many who march that don't know God. There are many who march who don't believe in God. There are many who march that don't trust God. But we who march, we who stand up, we who protest, we ought to bring the power of the Holy Ghost into that experience. That's what they did in the 50s and 60s. That's what made the difference. They stood upon moral and, and, and spiritual values. And they brought that to bear upon the challenges of the day. We have not yet overcome. We are still overcoming. But as we overcome, we have to recognize that we overcome by working to overcome. Their job was to work to get us the right to vote. Their job was to work to get us the right for uh, equal accommodations. We can go to any hotel in this country because they fought that fight. We are treated equally. We don't pay a black price and a white price because they fought that battle. That's not the battle for us to fight. We're able to go and vote because they fought that battle. But they fought that battle because the vote is our voice. It's our way of speaking. It's our way of challenging. It's our way of protesting. It's our way of changing. But when we don't vote, we don't speak. When we don't vote, we're quiet. When we don't vote, we cannot get justice. 
and righteousness. Because when we don't vote, we opt out. And when we opt out, we let any or anything else go. You're seeing it right now. We opted out. There is no question in my mind, and any of the experts will tell you, that the most important vote in the United States of America is the vote of African American males. Young males in particular. That is the most important vote because when that block votes, wherever they, whatever they vote for wins. But we bought into the mindset that our votes don't matter. We bought into the mindset that what we do don't matter. And so we opt out. And when we opt out and sit at home, we watch Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. And it's not about Republican or Democrat, or even independent for that matter. But it's about voting for righteousness and justice. And yes, no man or woman is righteous and just completely. But God knows you should be able to see the difference in the presentation that people bring before you. My actual says when you people show you who they are, Believe them. When people show you who they are, believe them. We have to use our voice because our voice changes things. And when we use our voice to change things, then we get to the point that justice begins to flow like waters. But when we don't use our voice, justice gets clogged up in a system of inequality and of racism and of challenges. God was serious. Don't come playing the religious game. Don't, don't, don't come being religious and, 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 and ritualistic and traditional. It's time to be real. And being real means to actually live, live this word that we learned. Live this word that, that we study. Live this word that we proclaim. Live this word that we say we believe in and we trust in and we stand upon. Justice is not going to flow, roll like waters, and, and, and righteousness is not, not going to flow like a mighty stream. If those who study justice and righteousness can't share it, can't teach it, can't illuminate it, can't allow somebody else to learn from it. We're not just church folks, we're Christians. We're not just folks who come into a place and, and worship God, we're people who live what we believe. And so I don't care where you are right now, we ought to be doing the things that change lives. Everybody should make sure everybody is voting because that's our voice. And if we don't use our voice, how do we get justice and righteousness? If we don't use our voice, how do they hear what says the Lord if we're sitting back opting out of the system? It's important for us to make sure we're counted so that we have the resources we need to do the things we need to do. The terrible sadness and tragedy of Chadwick Bozeman's death is the fact that he died of a disease that disproportionately kills <clears throat> African-American men. He died of a disease that they don't even start preparing you for until you get 50. Yet he died at 43. Because there's so many people in our community who are not getting the health care they need. But then we don't want to write that, we don't want to count in the census. And we wonder why we don't have the dollars that we need. You and I, as believers, we ought to help to convey to our community the honesty and the truth necessary for our community to become stronger. A young man, gone from our midst. And we see this time and time again. Because we opt out. We feel like that has nothing to do with us. And that's a problem, saints. 
Because when we do that, when we opt out, when we act like that we don't have anything to do with anything, then everything goes awry. There's no way justice is going to roll like righteousness, and, uh, like, 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 uh, like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream if we are not engaged and involved. So if we're not helping people to understand the power of the census, the power of the census. For 10 years, everything, we, every dollar we get in our community is based on what we do to this year. But the next 10 years, you don't count five-year-olds because they're five. They'll be 15 in 10 years. So during their developmental time, they're not even counted. We don't even get resources for them. And then we wonder what happens to our children and what happens to our schools and what happens to our streets and what happens to our community. We are the saints of God. We have to speak truth. And we have to do the work. True Christians do work. We don't just sit back as if we're on an island unto ourselves. Being a Christian is not being on a Caribbean vacation for life. Being a Christian means doing the hard work. And most of us, the thing I want us to break down is this, this, this dream that we have, this, this fantasy that we have, that being a Christian means everything is going to go our way all the time. It's not. Because in the human life that we live, Things are going to challenge us. And God knows if we were never challenged, we would forget who God is. We have a responsibility to engage within our communities and within ourselves and within our churches and within our homes. And we can't opt out. We can't afford to continue to opt out. Because I'm going to tell you, it doesn't just hurt others, it hurts everybody. And even people who think they're getting over, who thinks it doesn't bother them, it hurts them as well. We're still overcoming. We're overcoming racism. We're overcoming injustice. We're overcoming inequality. Overcoming joblessness. We're overcoming addictions and drugs. We're overcoming educational despair. We're overcoming gains. We're still overcoming. We're overcoming ignorance. We're overcoming uh, uh, miseducation. We're overcoming a lot of foolishness. We are still overcoming. And the problem is not that we're still overcoming. The problem is that we're surprised that we're still overcoming. That we act like we should already be overcome. I don't know where we expect we should be. I, I guess we expect that right now we should have the time of our lives sitting down doing nothing. But I want you to know. I want you to get this and I want you to understand this. That people who fight against righteousness, they fight against it every day. People who fight against God and against spirit, they fight against it every day. They don't stop doing it. They continue to do it. Folks who fight against, uh, who, who fight for oppression and who fight racist, they don't, they're not, they don't ra they're not racist every once in a while. They don't racist every day. They, chill. they are racist every day. They're doing that work every day to keep you held down and we're not doing anything. And then every once in a while, we want to get up and march down the street and call it a day. But every day they, they, they are practicing it. Every day they are fine-tuning who they are. And every day we sit back and opt out as if we don't know who we are or whose we are. So we get complacent about overcoming. We've forgotten that overcoming is rooted in God. It's not rooted in somebody else. We're sitting around waiting for the cavalry to come. We're waiting for somebody to come and rescue us. We're waiting for somebody to come and make our streets better. And why they don't do this and why nobody's coming to help us, especially if we're not willing to help ourselves. If we're not willing to fight for righteousness and justice, to fight for what we need and to fight for what we have and to fight for who we believe God is. So when you opt out, when you sit back and you kick your legs up in a chair, it limits what we expect to receive. Dr. King didn't go to jail as a criminal. Let's be clear. He broke the law. But he wasn't a criminal. He was arrested and he was incarcerated because he fought against an unjust system. He didn't just randomly do so. He, right, you know what I'm saying? So he, uh, let, me, let me make it clear for y'all. Dr. King didn't decide that because the society was unfair, that he would then cheat on his taxes. So he didn't go to jail for tax evasion. 
Now, the king did not decide that because it was unfair that he would write a bad check. He didn't go to, ch go to, go to, go to, go to jail for fraudulent checks. He went to jail specifically to attack unjust laws that were in place and that have now been annihilated. Too many of us have given up our moral authority for a hypocritic, for a hypocritical false sense of judgment that indicts as much as it indicts those proponents of injustice. It also indicts those who participate. When you're wrong, you're wrong. And two wrongs don't make a right. I don't know, my mother told me that a long time ago. She always said, two wrongs don't make a right. But there is a such thing as justice, and there is a such thing as righteousness, and those are the things that we should fight for with all of our being. And injustice and, 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 and inequality and, and racism and oppression and sexism, those are the things that we need to be fighting against every single day. It is amazing how many black male Christians I heard in 2017 say I didn't vote for her because she was a woman. Is that godly? Is that, we decide that because of a person's gender that, that, that we would decide whether they can serve? Man, I, I, I can't even imagine it. I, I can't imagine how, how you can compare somebody's gender with somebody's ignorance. It's amazing that within our community, we still have this color struggles. We don't like him because he's too dark, and we don't like her because she's too light. Man, that stuff should have been gone way back in the 50s and the 40s. I can't believe that in 2020, we still play those petty games. And guess who's playing it? Us? Christians? But then we say we want justice to flow like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. But yet every time somebody comes into the doors of our churches, we're judging them, questioning them, looking at their outward appearance and making decisions about them. Is that justice? Is that righteousness? Is that holy? Or do we still think we can play this game? It is important for us, brothers, to determine, to discern God's plan. See, God has a plan. He has a plan for us. He has a plan to prosper us and to give us hope and to give us a future. It, it may not look like it to us, but God has a plan. And if we don't want to work within God's plan, how do we get what God has planned for us? Israel was bringing sacrifices and offerings to the Lord on the feast days, but their lives were corrupt, so their offerings were rejected by God. Is your life corrupt? He, he would rather have righteousness than ritual. Even in the wilderness, when professing to worship Jehovah, they had practiced idolatry with uh, Moloch and other idols. Amos here affirms that God's people's loyalty is shown not in elaborate and expressive ceremony, but in a steady, rather than sporadic, justice in human relationships and righteousness and obedience to God's will. Justice and righteousness ought to be a steady part of who we are, not just what we put on and do, for sure, or when we want to get our way. The people were calling for the day of the Lord, thinking that it would bring an end to their troubles. But God says, you don't even know what you're asking for. The day of the Lord would bring justice, and justice would bring punishment for the people who deserved it for their sins. See, the thing about it is that the day of, of the Lord, it, 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 brings, it brings justice. And if we are justly cited for who we really are, we're in trouble because we're contemptuous. But the blessing for us is that on the day of judgment, we who have accepted Christ expect him to step in on our behalf. Praise God. So that's our blessing. But you really want to call on the day of, uh, of the Lord? You want to live as if you really want God to bless you? If we're living in 
of sin and we're living sinful lives and using religious rituals and traditions to make ourselves look good, God will despise our worship and will not accept our offering. He wants sincere hearts, not the songs of hypocrites. When you worship in church, are you more concerned about your image or your attitude? I, for example, if I, if I told you to come in here today, wouldn't you be more concerned about how you look and, and, and how people think about you? Or would you really be more concerned about what's in your heart, what God has done in you, through you, and wants to do from you? Or is it still about the stuff? We're still overcoming. We're still imperfect. So we still need to do the work. And I want to challenge you to discern God's plan. And then the second thing I want you to understand is that you have a role in God's plan. Each and every one of us have a role in God's plan. We were all created for that role in God's plan. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you do. I don't care how you live. You have a role in God's plan. And if you want, you can perform that role in God's plan. But you can also reject it. And many of us reject the role that we're supposed to play in God's plan, but then we want everything to be what we want it to be and wonder why it's not. Find out what your role is to communicate with God. Get intimate with God. You can't find out what your role is with God if you don't listen to him. You don't spend any time with him. And if you're helping him, doing it your way. It's not going to work. As for me, I will serve the Lord. I will remain focused on listening, serving, and worshiping God with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind and all my strength. God hated the religious practices of the Israel of Israel and refused to accept them. Why? Because justice was absent from the Israel, Israelite society. Y'all, please don't let us be those people. Please don't let us be those people. We come in here and we worship and we gather and we vote and all and we do all of this stuff. Please don't let us be a group of people who get together and there is no justice within our midst. A reminder that you can't worship God on Sundays and despise your neighbor and your family on Monday or Sunday evening for that matter. You can't read your Bible in private and then oppress Brothers and sisters in public? The Lord therefore calls his people to let justice flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. Martin King underscored the connection between having faith in God and doing works of righteousness when he quoted Amos in that speech. Oh yes, we just know it as I have a dream. But that dream came from somewhere. It was deeply rooted not only in the American dream, but it was deeply rooted in the justice and the righteousness that God demands of his people. And I promise you, it will come to bear upon all of us. We think everybody else has it better than us. Imagine what it must be to get up every day and to fight against God's will. Imagine what it must be to get up every day and to claim to be Christians, but to do things that are absolutely, totally unchristian. That has to be a tormented life. I don't want to know what it feels like. And I don't want to know what it ends up being. We've got to determine to find God's plan. We've got to determine to find our role in God's plan. And we've got to be committed to God's plan. Instead of a ritual, uh, a ritual and performance, uh, God wants relentless commitment to justice and righteousness. He wants a passionate concern for the rights of poor people and, and the concern uh, that will roll like an ever-flowing river, uh, like an unfailing stream that did not run dry. God wants a day-to-day -day life of surging integrity and goodness and honesty. Only this outer evidence of inner righteousness could offer the Israelites and us the possibility of survival in the day of the Lord. Remember, our life and living is a marathon, not a sprint. It's a relay, not an individual race. You cannot do it alone, but together we can do it. Yes, we can. We can overcome. Yes, we can. But we must get serious about our responsibility and about our role and about our understanding of what it is that God wants and not what it is that somebody else wants, but what God God wants for us. 
Brothers and sisters, we must vote when it's time to vote. We must count and be counted when it's time to be counted. We must plan and strategize when, when it's time for that and be committed to our people and to our lives and to the program and to the ways in which we work to make a difference, not only just for people, but for God. But if we make, if we do what God called us to do, if we work for God, we'll change the lives of others. Because God wants people to be free. And that's why we live in this country. That's what we, we celebrate about this country, is that this country it was, was, was founded and rooted in the idea, in the concept of being free. And that concept was rooted in the word of God. So how is it that we have strayed so far away from what the word of God says? And we didn't just stray 200 years later. We've been straying for a long time. Facts are that we probably, we've been straying from the time everybody got here. Except those indigenous people who knew how to respect God and respect his land. Those indigenous people who knew how to protect the land that we're now wondering why is in such ruins. We must never give up and get tired and give in and stop. We must continue to do our part and help uh, her do her part and help him do his part and, and to aid them in doing their parts. We might have to skip a few parties or, or, uh, to help our people rise. We might have to miss some gatherings uh, to stand up for our people. We might have to sacrifice some fun or some barbecues for the sake of everyone. We might have to rise up and stand strong and walk tall in an effort to make a difference in the lives of those whom we share this space and time with. We must not only vote, but we must begin to pick our own candidates, choose our own slate, grow our own leaders, recruit the brightest stars, engage in our instruction and in our teaching and in our education to ensure that our children not only know who others are, but that they even know who they are. Do you really expect somebody else to teach our children our history? Really? Do you really expect somebody else to come in and teach your child what your child really needs to know about who your child is? Do you really expect that? Our children must understand that others' lives matter, but that their lives matter. And in addition to them acting like our kids' lives don't matter, sometimes we act like our kids' lives don't matter. We always want to judge what they have on, how they act, how they behave, without providing any instruction for how to act and how to behave. It's amazing how quickly and how soon we forget. And you can use all the excuses you want. Because I've been doing this for a long time. I've been doing this for a long time. Not as long as y'all. I've been doing this for a long time. And I will tell you. I have never let the fear of somebody's mother cussing me out. Keep me from telling them the truth. Teach me from checking them when they're wrong. And it's, it's weird because that's how most of us grew up. Even when our parents weren't around, because you don't act the same when your parents are around and when your parents are not around. So when our parents weren't around, we didn't have grown folks walking by acting like it was okay with what we were doing. And I, you, you, the, the reason we're going to let our community fall apart is that we're afraid somebody to cuss us out? Come on, you know, for real. Who among us have not, has not been cussed, cussed out? And God knows we keep living, we might get cussed out again. So that's going to be our reason for letting ourselves go. We must seek justice. We must, we must train and teach our children. Teach them daily without reservation, without hesitation, without misunderstanding or misgiving. That their lives matter. If we don't teach Trayvon that his life, Trayvon, if we don't teach Trayvon that his life matters, who's going to teach him that his life matters? Oh, oh, we're going to wait. <laughs> we're going to wait for him to get into an altercation with a police officer, and that's going to determine whether his life matters. That should be our story and gift to him every day of his life. And we should not wait until some, alter, some random altercation with somebody who doesn't care about him to then determine and define his life. And then all of a sudden, we decide that his life matters. And so now we want to put his name on a T-shirt. Now we want to stand up for him. 
How about we stand up for him today while he's still here? How about we stand up for them today while they're still here? How about we let justice roll like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream? Not just after the fact, but let's do that now, today. And when we do that, then we can challenge other people to do that. Hate evil and love God. And establish justice in the court of the city gates. Perhaps the Lord of hosts will be gracious in the remnant of Joseph. The text further says, I hate and I despise and reject your sacred speech. And I do not take delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you have offered me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fattened animals. Take the noise of your songs away from me. They are an irritation. I shall not even listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, flowing abundantly and flowing continuously. Did you bring me sacrifices and grain offerings during the 40 years in the wilderness of the house of Israel? Certainly not. You can carry it along with the king, uh, uh, your, your man-made gods of Saturn, your images of your stars and gods you made for yourself. So we can't expect to keep creating other idols for ourselves and not serving our God and then expect God to be glad when we come bring him some ritualistic sacrifice and offering. We must change our behavior and our example. Uh, we must be the light of the world and the salt of the earth that this city needs and that this region needs. We must return to God and God's vision and God's dominion. We cannot continue to spend another minute in this small internal battles and fights when God is calling us to rise up and to serve. We cannot spend one more minute arguing and disrupting over cake flavors and tie colors and song choices and small stuff. That makes God sick to his stomach. Remember how you felt when your children Children were arguing over a seatbelt in the back seat, and you were like, enough already. That is how God feels when we argue over, over petty, petty things. We decide that we can't find anybody who's perfect, so we're not going to support uh, anyone. Think about who we are and what we do. Think about it. How many of us have even tried? How many of us, seriously, I, and, I, and, and I know I'm stepping out of bounds, but think about this. Uh, we, we all love Marsha Fudge, our great congresswoman from the great state of Ohio. We love her to death. Have we supported her? I mean, seriously, how many of us have actually supported her campaign? We just hope that she wins every year. We don't make any control. We don't support her. We don't go out and walk for her. Do we? But yet it's still, when somebody else comes around with a boo cool money, drop it down and, and get elected, we start talking about, oh, they don't treat us right. We don't even support the people who try to work for us. But let justice roll like water. It righteousness us like a mighty stream. So it's okay that we're still overcoming. Because we are overcoming from a different position. See, we're not overcoming from the same place we were back in the 50s and 60s. We're overcoming from another place. And to be clear, we are overcoming from the comforts of Cleveland Heights, not from the despair of the ruins of a burnt up puff. But let justice roll like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. We're overcoming from the peace of Beachwood. I, I know your, your, your president don't know y'all live in these suburbs. It's all good. It's all good. We, 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 we're overcoming from the peace of Beachwood. Not the rancor of Lee Harvard and the pain that we cannot ignore. But the justice will like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. We're overcoming from Highland Hills and, and Pepper Pike and Solon and Bedford and Aurora and Oakwood. But we cannot ignore the potholes in the streets of East Cleveland, those on Quincy. But let justice roll like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. We must remember that God has a plan for us and that we must yield to that plan and trust that plan and that we must find our role and our place in that plan and stay committed to that plan and reject our hatred and hating our hypocrisy and being hypocritical. We must work for justice, live right, and consider the plight of all God's people, not just the good, not just the comfortable, and not just the popular, but we must be fighting for justice for all, all the kids in our community all the people of our community and all of those who depend, depend on us to fight. We're still overcoming. 
But we must let justice roll like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Let us pray. Almighty God, I ask you in the name of Jesus to teach us to live just and righteous lives that we might be the proponents of justice and righteousness and that we might let it flow like right, let justice flow like waters and righteousness is like a mighty stream. God, I pray for your healing upon your people, your people who are, who are sick and tired of being sick and tired, your, your, your children who are, are sick and tired of having to duck bullets as they play in their homes and in their yards and in their parks. God, I ask you in the name of Jesus Christ, help us to stand up and to be the people you created us to be, to live according to the will that you have for us, and then acknowledge the blessings, the blessings of a great and mighty God that gives us the strength to fight and to fight on against all of the oppression that comes against us. We ask you, O oh God. And so now, God, we ask that you bless all of our sick and shut-in members. We lift up Wendell Napier and Tanya Owens and Anthony Maston. And we ask you to continue, God, to bless all of our families who lost loved ones. And God, teach us all how to live righteous lives that we might stand and be able to say that we fought, that justice would flow like waters, and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thank you, O oh God, and I pray you for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.